Lord Waldegrave, turning then to um, the position of those who were infected with HIV through transfusion, if we can pick matters up in your statement, WITN 5288001, page 77, please. It's paragraphs 4.108. Um, you, you refer above to a, a range of documents, some but, but not all of which that we'll, we'll look at. Um, and then you um, say this, the inquiry asks how much I knew about the position of the non-haemophiliacs who had developed AIDS before I received the correspondence referred to above. I am afraid that I find this impossible to answer. Because the haemophiliac HIV litigation was in a relatively advanced position, and because I wanted to change policy in relation to it, it was my immediate focus and the focus of the submissions coming to me from officials. I have already referred to the early briefing from Mr. Canavan dated the 6th of November 1990. I've also referred to the fact that item B to that briefing identified the then 120 cases of HIV infection through blood transfusion, including transplants, as one of the knock-on effects of the department slash NHS liability was established in the haemophiliac litigation. So I think it's fair to say that I was made aware very early of the cohort of NHS patients infected with HIV through blood transfusion. However, so long after the events, I'm not able to give any kind of timeline as to how my knowledge of the blood transfusion cases developed. Looking at the papers now, it is clear that one effect of the announcement of the December 1990 in principle settlement for haemophiliacs infected by HIV was to emphasize by contrast the case of those infected by blood transfusion. And then you refer to some documents, again, some of which we'll, we'll look at. So um, is this right? You, you knew of the existence of... Mm. Um, a, a number of individuals mm. who had been infected with HIV either through transfusion or through organ transplant um, a, as at November 1990? Uh, well, it's certainly there as one of the examples of given of, of where it will be difficult to hold the line. Whether I focused on them more or less than the, the um, benzodiazepine cases and the other ones, I, I'm not quite sure at that point. Um, was any thought given, whether by you or, to your knowledge, officials within the department, to such patients being included in the December 90 settlement? I'm sure not. Um, I am sure, now here I run a little bit ahead, we'll come back to this I think in the documents, I am sure that if, if, I'm not saying I consciously thought about this and rejected it, but if I had sought to widen that perimeter, the chances of getting agreement would have been zero, I think, because people would at that stage have said, well, we understand that you're willing, we, we need to settle these cases that, that had so high profile around this litigation. You now want to go off in a whole lot of other cases and there's no end to it. And I think I, it would have it would have made it very difficult indeed if I had tried to do that. I'm not saying that I thought that and consciously rejected it. Though I note that in one of the newspaper reports, there's a, one of the lawyers for the victim saying, we have left this till after the other ones were settled. It's almost as if they were, <laughs> if I was clever enough to have thought like that myself, I'd be taking the credit for it, but I don't think I was. Um, and we'll look in due course when we go through some of the documents mm. chronologically both at how officials within the department mm. responded when you did ask for information mm. about that and how in due course the mm. Treasury responded. Yes. I did start worrying about it pretty early on. There's the April the 23rd discussions and so on. I did think yes. a bit before that too. Yeah, and just, so just picking up then in the contemporaneous documentation uh, to start with DHSC 0003657 underscore 119. Um, now, this is a letter from a firm um, of solicitors uh, in Scotland. Um, it's dated the 18th of December 1990. It's addressed to you, um, and it's copied um, uh, to, amongst others, the Prime Minister um, and to Robin Cook MP. Um, 
it says, Dear Minister, I act for a number of people passed to me by the Law Society of Scotland and from medical specialists, and my task is to attempt to obtain compensation for them as a result of their having developed AIDS as a result of whole blood transfusions which were HIV infected. I'm sure that you will be aware of the correspondence and submissions to your predecessor in office and questions asked in Parliament by a number of members irrespective of political affiliation. I have a copy of the detailed response made by your predecessor to those questions, but I still have not had a rational or adequate explanation of how the situation of people such as my clients can be distinguished from that of the unfortunate haemophiliacs uh, who are also sadly um, affected. Um, uh, afflicted. Uh, sorry, afflicted. Uh, and then um, the um, next paragraph refers to the likelihood of legal action uh, and then picking it up in the bottom of the page, the only adequate and reasonable solution is a settlement such as been offered to the haemophiliacs who are unfortunately also infected. The numbers of people infected through whole blood transfusions is impossible to predict, but in my experience in Scotland, despite efforts to ask them to come forward, we have knowledge at present of very few. Those I know of are in single figures. Even if a settlement, however, were to provoke many more claims, Surely it is only decent and honourable to meet those claims. Equally, from any objective point of view, it must be more sensible rather than expend money on lawyers such as me through the Legal Aid Fund to compensate the unfortunate victims, especially bearing in mind that a number of them are very young people. Indeed, one of my clients is a five-year-old boy and another an 18-year-old girl. And then we see reference to the letter being copied to the Prime Minister himself because of the vital and desperate nature of the situation faced by my clients. Um, now, I don't know whether um, this is a letter that would have made its way to you. I don't think the documentation provides a, a, an answer to that. Um, I, I'll double check. I, I don't know. It would have gone, I think, to one of the ministers, certainly, because it had been copied to number 10, um, and they, it would almost certainly have gone to a minister, I think, possibly me. Um, but in any event, it's, it's an example of um, the issue being drawn to the attention, at least, yes. of the department yes. as at December 1990. And I don't think... Um, I, I, I think I was aware, aware of this pretty quickly afterwards and began, and began fretting about it pretty quickly. Um, and then we can see that the same issue being picked up now by an MP... Um, in January um, of 1991, so about three weeks later, at DHSC 0042272 underscore 145. Um, this is from John Marshall, um, who, who was, um, I think we've seen from other uh, material, uh, a... a um, a passionate advocate on this issue, January the 8th, 1991. Um, it's addressed to um, a, a Sydney Chapman MP, but he tells us in the bottom of the letter that he's sending you a copy of it. It says, uh, so it refers to the Rosie Barnes Bill, and that's the no fault compensation yes. bill that we saw referred to earlier uh, in, uh, by reference to Harriet Harman. Um, as you know, we will be debating this bill shortly after Parliament's return. It does seem to me that there are two points we must address. We needn't worry about the, the first point. The second relates to the plight of the 200 or so NHS patients other than haemophiliacs who contracted AIDS as a result of receiving infected blood. Currently, they have received no compensation. The cost of treating them in the same way as haemophiliacs similarly infected would be slight, about £15 million, to argue that we are compensating haemophiliacs because their illness is hereditary but will not compensate others is bad morality, poor logic and bad politics. Action to deal with this anomaly would help to improve the case against Rosie Barnes' bill. I'm sending William Watergrave a copy um, of this letter. Um, d d now, again, w whether or not you saw this particular letter at the time, it's clearly coming on any view to the department. Is it likely, because it came from Mr Marshall um, and was copied to you, that, that you would have seen it? Whether I saw it or not, I think it's almost certain he would have, he would have uh, grasped hold of me in the voting lobby and made his case. Um, 
in any event, whether or not um, the letter itself came across your desk, do you have any, any reflection looking at it now on the suggestion that um, um, compensating haemophiliacs but not others is bad morality, poor logic and bad politics? Well, that's powerfully put. Um, and indeed, I came to accept that argument, yes. Okay. And, and we'll look at how, how that came about. Um, so if we then turn to... Uh, uh, in fact, I think we can see from the next document that you, you did see, I think, Mr Marshall's letter. Um, if we turn to DHSC 0042272 underscore 142. This is a minute from Mr Canavan dated the 14th of January 1991. It's addressed to Mr Alcock, so your, your principal private secretary again. I attach a background brief and line to take the briefing covers the second point in John Marshall's letter of the 8th of January. And then if we go to the... That sounds like a, a briefing for an actual meeting, doesn't it? A briefing in a line to take rather than a draft for a letter. Yes, it may be. Um, I don't think the, the attached document um, uh, I expe I expect it. I was saying, I, I met John Marshall and he's put this and, you know, and so on. So. Uh, and so if we look at the attached um, brief and line to take, it's at DHSC... 042272 underscore 143. Um, if we just zoom in at the top of the page, yes. thank you. So background, the figures relating to HIV slash AIDS infection in UK through blood transfusion are as follows. Reported cases infected with HIV, 131. Breakdown of place of transfusion, not available. Reported cases with AIDS as at November 1990. And then there's a breakdown as between cases of transfusion in the UK and cases abroad. Um, two, the previous two awards to haemophiliacs in 1987 and 1989 have been followed by campaigns to give similar financial help to those who'd contracted HIV AIDS as a result of blood transfusions. The payments to haemophiliacs have recognised their wholly exceptional circumstances, whereby they were doubly disadvantaged by their pre-existing haemophilia as well as the HIV infection, we have accepted from the outset the need to ring fence haemophiliacs because of their special circumstances. People infected with HIV as a result of blood, transflu tr blood transfusion slash transplants are no different in principle from other groups of patients harmed as an unfortunate side result of NHS treatment. For example, there are cases which fall into the category of those who acquired HIV through skin grafts or organ transplants. Any special treatment for HIV-infected blood transfusion recipients would reap a cuss by exciting expectations which could be difficult to contain in other groups of patients harmed as an unintended byproduct of NHS treatment. The direct cost of conceding for UK transfused cases with AIDS would be around £1 million, and if all HIV cases are included, the cost could be around £5 million. The more exceptions that are made the closer we move to no-fault compensation without discussing the rationale and the greater the number of claims that would result from those who feel that they too are deserving. And so against that background, the line to take that you were given, payments for haemophiliacs recognise their unique combination of circumstances. These do not apply to blood transfusion recipients. So it, would it be fair to understand the departmental line at this point in time is, is to hold or try to hold the ring fence and, and not um, extend the financial provision any further? Not just at this point in time, throughout. Um, and then we can see uh, uh, a minute of the 29th of January from Mr Dobson, DHSC 0002431 underscore 013. Um, this is dated the 29th of January 91, as you see. Um, the heading is NHS Compensation Bill. Um, uh, there's a reference to a, 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 a minute from Mr. Wilson. Uh, and then I attach a briefing for the Secretary of State on HIV-infected haemophiliacs. Pressure is mounting for something to be done for HIV-infected blood transfusion recipients. And this is covered um, in uh, the background note. Um, I don't think there's anything significantly different in the background note um, 
um, from what we've already seen, but for those who um, uh, um, may be assisted by having the reference uh, for the transcript, it's DHSC 0041437 underscore 018. Um, and, and as I said, it, it maintains the, 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 the same line. Uh, so um, the, the reference to pressure is mounting. There was clearly parliamentary pressure through John Marshall um, and others. Um, were you aware also of public pressure at, at this point in, in time? I, I'm sure I was. The only thing I would say about this is that the Secretary of State for Health at that time, there were, I was under an immense range of pressures. I, I had the misfortune or good fortune, depending on which side of the coin you were on, to be facing the most formidable parliamentary uh, forensic opponent in Parliament at that time, Robin Cook, who was leading a major campaign against our health service reforms, uh, assisted by the BMA um, and many others. So um, there were lots and lots and lots of pressures. <laughs> I doubt if this was very high amongst those, um, those, one, those overall uh, range of pressures, but it was certainly there. Well, I think the next document I wanted to take you to is from Robin Cook. <laughs> he, um, was, he was very good at it. Uh, and we'll see that at DHSC 0002850 underscore 004. Here, I think, is evidence of further parliamentary pressure. This is 31st of January from Mr Cook mm. to you. In the first paragraph, he refers to Mrs Bottomley's parliamentary answer... Um, about uh, numbers uh, who were um, infected as a result of blood transfusion, uh, and he refers to two of those being constituents and, of his. And this is very important. This is him acting not so much as a, a leading member of the Labour Party, but as a good constituency MP. And if we pick it up in the second paragraph, he says this, the recent settlement with haemophiliacs who are HIV positive has again raised awareness among this group of the injustice of their position. Frankly, I find it wholly untenable to accept that the NHS has a responsibility to provide financial compensation to one group who are HIV positive as a result of NHS treatment, whilst denying the same response to another group of NHS patients who are also HIV positive as a result of NHS treatment. I could understand, although not accept this distinction, if the group to whom liability was being denied was the larger group with the larger cost. But the continued refusal to accept responsibility in this case is all the more difficult to comprehend as the numbers involved are so few and the cost of settlement would be so much less than the amount already provided for the greater number of haemophiliacs. I'm not sure that I much like the argument that it wouldn't so much matter if they were a larger group, but there we are. Um, and then he says, I do appreciate that it is important for the NHS and no doubt the Treasury that a clear ring fence is drawn around any compensation made in order to avoid a precedent for wider claims from other NHS patients. However, it does seem to me wholly untenable to try and erect a ring fence around one group of HIV-positive patients whilst leaving another group outside. It would surely be much more easy to defend a ring fence which accepted that this precedent applied only to those patients who became HIV-positive as a result of treatment with infected blood or blood products and did not apply in any wider medical circumstances. These are the points which I've urged at intervals over the past three years. I hope, though, that now there is obviously a greater willingness to resolve this matter, it will be possible for you to take a fresh look at the claim of this small group and put them on a par with the settlement to haemophiliacs. Um, leaving aside the point at which you said you didn't much like, um, uh, is, is there anything else in, in, in Robin Cook's letter that, that you would disagree with? It's a very good letter. I, I'm sort of letter I hope I would have been able to write if I'd been a backbench constituency MP. Well, he was a front bench. And we'll look in due course how you did come to take a fresh look yeah. at, at, at the claim. But again, I just want to take it in stages. Um, um, your reply um, is at DHSC 0003560 underscore 032. It's dated the 7th of March, 1991. Uh, um, in paragraph two, uh, having referred to um, 
greatest sympathy and then the settlement offer for haemophiliacs announced in December, you say opinion in the House and in all parts of the country has recognised that the tragic combination of circumstances of those with haemophilia and HIV are exceptional and justify the special provision which has been made. The government has carefully considered the arguments for extending payments to people other than haemophiliacs who have been infected with HIV as a result of NHS treatment. Our view remains that people who were infected with HIV as a result of blood or blood component transfusion are no different in principle from other groups of patients harmed as an unfortunate side effect of NHS treatment. Any special provision for those transfused could itself create inequity and attract criticism. Difficult questions would arise whether to distinguish between those transfused in the United Kingdom and those transfused abroad, between those abroad for a UK company and those on holiday. The validation of claims would also not be as straightforward as for haemophiliacs whose medical history is well known. And then over the page. More widely, it would be difficult to maintain the distinction between blood component transfusion cases and the recipients of skin grafts or organ transplants who have been infected with HIV, or people with other transfusion transmitted diseases, or people who have suffered catastrophic side effects of other medical treatment. I'm sorry if this is a disappointing reply, but I hope it explains why we have no plans to extend the special financial help for haemophiliacs to those infected through blood transfusions. Now, the points made in the letter we'll see picked up in um, that they reflect the points that were being made to you by, by, by officials in, yes. in, in a range of different situations. We were maintaining the policy until we changed it. And um, uh, some of the secondary issues they raised there, like good officials, when told to change the policy, they solved the secondary issues. But the, the principal issue around precedent remained a dangerous issue for them and for us. But in the end, I think we put the, the, I think we were right to concede to the arguments that Robin Cook put eligently in his letter. And the secondary issues there refer to the issue of infection abroad on, on or validation before, of claims. Yes, things, things of those kind, which were, were doubtless difficult, but they managed to solve them. Um, uh, then, uh, if we just uh, um, go back to a minute we looked at um, earlier today, uh, just to remind ourselves, at DHSC 0003662 underscore 080. This is the minute of the 22nd of April 91 that we looked at. The first paragraph uh, deals with the final settlement of the uh, HIV litigation. And the second is, is the request for a detailed note for you on the position of other patients. Now, um, D does that reflect um, the, the, the fact that y you want now to, to start to look again at, at the, the established policy? It reflects, the, yes, it does. It reflects the fact that as some disrespectful but um, understandable junior official says I was getting twitchy. Yes, yes, we may, we may pick that up um, when we look at the document. Um, uh, we can see the note in question uh, is at DHSC 0003560 underscore 051. So this is from Mr. Dobson, dated the 23rd of April 1991. The first paragraph refers to the fact that at the meeting you'd asked for a note on the position. Um, uh, and then uh, paragraph two, it said, the cost of a scheme limited to people with HIV transfused in the UK would not be trivial, probably some three to five million, depending on assumptions. But the real difficulty over granting a concession would be to re-establish a credible ring fence to prevent any further movement towards a general system of no-fault compensation. The government has always justified its special provision for HIV-infected haemophiliacs on the grounds that they are a uniquely unfortunate group, in particular because the tragedy of infection with the HIV virus was superimposed on a severe hereditary disability. In contrast, it's difficult to draw any logical distinction between the HIV-infected blood transfusion cases and other victims of medical accidents. If ministers wish to reconsider the case for some general system of no-fault compensation, that is another matter. But in my view, the worst of all possible worlds 
will be to slide into no-fault compensation through a series of reluctant concessions to well-orchestrated campaigns. One final point is that Treasury would strongly resist any further concession and might well accuse us of bad faith in even considering it. The danger of knock-on effects was raised with Treasury officials in the discussions leading up to last December's announcement, but the assumption was that a settlement for the haemophiliacs could be ring-fenced. At a time when Treasury are trying to renege on their agreement to fund the haemophiliac settlement, that must be the spat that we looked yep. at this, uh, earlier, Lord Watergrave, it would be particularly unfortunate for us to put up the price even by a modest amount. Um, I, is it um, fair to read that as a, as a fairly clear attempt to steer you away from a change of policy? It certainly is. I don't think much of any of the arguments except those in paragraph three. Um, the, uh, all the other arguments can be dealt with and were, in, were dealt with in the end. It was wise, I think, to warn me that um, uh, to tangle a, a shift in this, at this point, when, the, when we were trying to get the Treasury to stick to their previous agreement, Treasury would say, well, now you're going back on your other one agreement so you can uh, that would have been very tactically foolish so uh, I think I would have paid a, a great deal of attention to that item three which is um, sounds like a sort of bureaucratic thing but it it is and it is a bureaucratic uh, matter but I once I'd begun to want to get this policy changed had to pay attention to tactics if I was to succeed and then, um, if we look over the page, I, I don't need to read through the, the majority of the document, um, uh, so we can have the whole page, Lawrence. So th this is what's attached to Mr. Dobson's uh, uh, minute. If we go to the next page, the arguments against compensation start towards the bottom of the page. I'm, I'm not going to read through the detail because, L Lord Waldegrave, you've given us your general response. Um, you'll see there the first point is about transfusion abroad, and if we go over the page. Well, those were difficult issues I ima imagine to handle, but they, they were good officials and they found ways of dealing with them. And the second is about validation. Again, that's an issue that wasn't due course addressed. With the panel and so forth. Yes. And yeah. um, points three, um, four and five then are really about the ring fence. Um, and again, we'll, uh, we've, we've touched on that and I'll come back to it in, in in due course when we get to the end of the chronology of documents. In this document, I just wanted to ask you about what's said on the next page, which is effect on the UK blood transfusion services. A another argument, which could not be voiced in public, is the effect on the UK blood transfusion services if any such payments were given. We understand that the vast majority of, if not all haemophiliacs, have been or will be tested for HIV, but the majority of blood transfusion recipients have not been tested. Any such payment could result in many of those transfused since 1978 wanting tests. This would put intolerable strain on the counselling and HIV testing services of the UK BTS. In consequence, <coughs> there would be great resistance from the blood transfusion service and major financial implications. Tests on this scale are bound to lead to requests for additional funding which, if not met, would have a severe impact on the normal functioning of the blood transfusion service. Um, what are your thoughts well, I, on I, that I argument? I have no recollection of this argument at all, and, and I've only just seen it in, uh, in the papers I don't know, for t today. It's a different kind of argument altogether, and it, it, it seems to disappear again afterwards, yes. um, so I find it rather odd. Um, None of these dire effects came about, as far as I know, so I don't quite know where this came from or where it went to. Well, you're right. I don't think it does appear in, in um, mm. any of the other submissions um, that, that you, you see on this issue. So it may be that other officials came to the conclusion that that wasn't a good argument and it better be removed. And then um, uh, if we go to DHSC... 0002433 underscore 058.
um, we can see that your decision at this point in time is to hold the line. So this is the 25th of April 1991. It's from Mr Alcock um, uh, to, uh, um, they're referred to as Dr Dobson. Um, the Secretary of State has seen your submission of the 23rd of April and agrees that we need to hold the line on these cases. He has added that we must emphasise the more complex history of what caused these tragic cases and say that the NHS cannot be pushed into taking general responsibility for cases like this. Um, wh wh why, doing the best you can, do you think that was your position at, at that stage? Well, that's the best we could do, I think. Um, it was becoming clear to me, both in sort of that these adjectives are difficult in moral, common sense, some kind of terms, that a better line was to put it around those infected by the NHS, although there were some here not infected by the NHS, of course, um, abroad, um, but those infected by um, medical procedures with um, HIV AIDS, and that that was an easier line to defend than, than the previous one, and a better one, um, because I think, as I think I said this morning, at the heart of my perception of, of the horror of all this was, and perhaps this was because I came to it later, was not so much the argument of the double jeopardy, uh, of, uh, appalling where that is, of a hereditary disease and then infected with a new disease which then there was no chance as far as we knew of surviving, but of the new disease of, of HIV AIDS. That was the, the thing that was at the forefront of my mind because of the, because of the stigma, because of the fear of it, um, and because of the effect it had on, on people's families and neighbors and everything. And there were some terrible stories uh, on those lines. So um, the more one came to think and concentrate on this subject, this smaller subject, smaller in terms of numbers, um, the more that fitted with my, my inclination. But at this point, you're still, still defending, defending the, the, the old line. policy, and I think it's, I think that would have I would have been influenced by that argument in paragraph three that this is the worst moment to take on the treasury on that just at the moment while we're still fighting to get them to stick to the deal on the uh, on the paying for the original deal. And then um, we have a, a minute from or on behalf of the chief medical officer. Um, around the same time, DHSC 0002862 underscore 006. This is the 29th of April 1991 um, from Jane Verity um, uh, to Mr Dobson, copied to Mr Alcock, so it would have come to your office. CMO has seen your minute of the 23rd of April, which supplied Secretary of State with a note on the present position on compensation for people infected with HIV through blood transfusion and on the cost that would be incurred if we were to extend to them the compensation scheme for haemophiliacs. CMO has commented that he thinks the only tenable argument of differentiation from haemophilia of any weight is in paragraph 3 of Annex A, and that, just to... That's not the same paragraph three that you're referring to, um, Lord Waldegrave. Um, that's, we don't need to go back to it, but that's the argument um, of double disadvantage and, and the hereditary nature of haemophilia. Uh, and then the CMO continues, the number of cases arising from other types of tissue transplanting, e.g. organ transplants and sperm, would be unlikely to go beyond the fingers of both hands maximum. CMO would be concerned with spread to hepatitis cases of various sorts. Um, do, do you know whether you had any, other than what we see here, this, this contribution, whether you had any discussions with the CMO, who still I think would have been Sir Donald Aitchison, on this issue? I can't remember any, but I would be, I think it likely that I would have done, yes. And, and likely that it might have come up at, at the regular meetings? Yes, probably. Well, certainly it would have done later on. Uh, I can't be sure of any time scale. Um, and then we get, I think, to the reference to you being twitchy. DHSC 0002913 underscore 008.
This is Mr Canavan um, to um, Mr Ahern in your private office, 31st of May 1991, headed blood transfusion recipients with HIV. I attach the note which the Secretary of State requested for his discussions with colleagues on this subject. So it looks like you've requested a further note. Yep. Um, and then if we go to the bottom of the page, to the handwritten entry, um, it says this, Charles, uh, I think that might be Mr Dobson, Dobson but I'm, yeah. um, S Secretary of State called a meeting last week. Miss Pierce will be able to fill you in. He is very twitchy, and I think I'll open a book on the date of the cave-in. And that's dated the 31st of, of, of May 1991. Um, again, would suggest a, perhaps a degree of irritation, unhappiness on the part of uh, officials with you wanting to question the line. I think that's putting it quite mildly, yes. <laughs> um, and then the note itself um, is at, um, or a version of it, is at SCGV 00002371194. underscore one nine four. Uh, compensation for blood transfusion recipients with HIV. So this is headed draft, but I think it's the, the, um, the, the best that we have. What's this a draft of, remind me? Yes, so um, it's, it's my understanding um, that this is a draft of um, the note that was being submitted to your office by Mr. Canavan. Oh, yes, that I'd requested. Yes. yes. Um, and then uh, we can see uh, in the first paragraph, uh, it says the settlement of 42 million for the haemophiliacs has sparked off a campaign for compensation for those who've become infected with HIV through blood transfusion. Similar campaigns were resisted following the announcement of the first payment of 10 million for the haemophiliacs in 1987 and the announcement of the payment of 20,000 each in 1989. On this occasion, the observer has picked up the issue and given it a higher profile so far, the department has received only one writ from a blood transfusion recipient, but there are signs that legal actions are being considered by many more. And then under the heading justification, we've always justified the special provision for haemophiliacs on the grounds that they were doubly disadvantaged. The problems of HIV were superimposed on the health, social and financial disadvantages they already suffered as a result of their hereditary haemophilia. This combination of circumstances would not generally apply to blood transfusion cases, those suffering from hereditary thalassemia or sickle cell anemia who require blood transfusions may claim to be doubly disadvantaged, but there are thought to be few with HIV. However, it is very difficult to get this argument across to the public who have considerable sympathy for the blood transfusion cases. Those campaigning on their behalf stress the similarities with the haemophiliacs. Both groups were infected through treatment and those infected can pass the HIV to their families. I think what means is it's very difficult to get this argument across to the Secretary of State. Um, yes. Uh, 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 but that would tend to suggest in the reference to the observer and campaign and to a writ that um, in addition to your own um, concerns about the, the, the line, there is a mounting um, degree of, of public uh, yeah, and concern the was, about and the was, it. Yes. And then if we go over the page, there's there's a list of pros and cons for extending compensation. Pros, relieves the political and media pressure at present on the government, reduces the risk of another round of embarrassing and costly litigation and criticism for forcing people with a fatal infection to take this course. Numbers and costs involved are relatively small, see Annex, if the concession can be ring-fenced. Removes the risk that a thalassemia or sickle cell case will be highlighted <coughs> and undermine our justification for exceptional help for haemophiliacs. While not all countries have state compensation schemes for HIV victims, most of those that we know about cover both blood transfusion and haemophiliac cases, e.g. Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Australia, Canada. Now, sorry, Lawrence, can we stick with that? So um, I think it's right to say that those pros are all either um, related to financial costs or to uh, um, reputational issues in relation to the government. There's no articulation there of a moral case, is there? 
Well, I think that they would sort of assume that that was included somewhere under little one. Thalassemia and sickle cell cases, incidentally, I might well have had on a constituency basis because I had communities in my constituency who had a high uh, prevalence of those conditions. Um, and then we can see the cons set out. Um, one, a further concession will send the message that the government will compensate if faced with an orchestrated campaign. It will be very difficult to re-establish a credible ring fence to prevent further placement movement towards a general no-fault scheme for medical accidents. Two, extending help to the blood transfusion cases would make it almost impossible to defend withholding it from those few who've become infected with HIV through That's tissue or organ transplants. That's quite correct, obviously. Yes. Uh, although I think we know from the CMO that I think he suggested that would be no more than 10. Uh, three, outside the HIV field, there's already public pressure for compensation for those children who receive treatment with human growth hormone and who may now be at risk of developing at CJD. Um, if we go to the next page, um, uh, um, uh, last sentence of that paragraph, moreover, there's a risk that additional people will acquire CJD through corneal and other transplants. <coughs> Four, there are other diseases transmitted through blood and blood products. In particular, most haemophiliacs were infected with hepatitis before blood products were heat treated. This is less serious than HIV, and although transmitted sexually, a vaccine against hepatitis B offers protection to spouses. Few haemophiliacs, few, I think that must be a typo, will die as a result of hepatitis. However, there are early moves to try to seek compensation for these people. Those accepting the HIV settlement are precluded from raising the hepatitis issue as the arguments are so similar to HIV. However, there are several thousand haemophiliacs who will not share in the settlement and who may feel that they have lost out and pressed the hepatitis case. Five, the many other examples of drug reaction and medical treatments given in good faith when non-negligent harm has occurred, and an example given there in relation to benzodiazepine. Six, ring fencing. The numbers may be very difficult as HIV spreads beyond the high-risk groups. Anyone who received blood before 1985 and contracts HIV in the future may refer back to the earlier transfusion, and it's unlikely to be feasible to establish the source of infection with certainty. Uh, it would, and then the next uh, paragraph, it would undermine the government's stance on no-fault compensation and make it difficult to resist pressures for a review. And then if we go over the page, we can see um, it, it said that further concessions could have repercussions for other departments. Paragraph 6, Treasury seems likely to resist any further concession. They've always been concerned that the payments to the haemophiliacs could have wider repercussions and have been anxious that those concessions should be ring-fenced. 7, the concession to blood transfusion cases might not remove the problem completely. And then there's reference to the fact that there would need to be a, a, a panel um, and the issue of patients abroad. Uh, and then 8, oh, in, indeed, I'm sorry, I, I was wrong earlier when I said the issue doesn't arise that same point that we explored a few minutes ago, Lord Waldegrave, is, is more, more shortly and sure, succinctly it's expressed It's sort of here. disappearing. Yes, it's compressed. Mm. Um, there could be pressure on HIV testing and counselling services, and then there's a suggestion to how it could raise fears generally about the safety of the blood supply. So those are the, those are the pros and cons. Um, there's then a section about options, um, uh, which uh, refers to, um, in paragraph 10... We could exclude those transfused abroad. This is defensible, and it would it said be consistent with the scheme for haemophiliacs, which is limited to those treated in the UK. So that disposes of that concern. Top of the next page, a more credible ring fence could be established around all those infected with HIV through medical treatment, as it would be very difficult to exclude those few who've been infected with HIV through tissue or organ transplant. HIV is the emotive issue and the public are unlikely to be convinced that it is reasonable to compensate those who were infected by one form of treatment but not another. Um, and then paragraph 12, if all those infected with HIV through medical treatment are to be compensated, in addition to haemophiliacs, the justification for ring-fencing these from all other victims of medical accidents would be that the HIV infection will be lifelong and can be transmitted to their spouses and children, Apart from using barrier methods of contraception, there's no way of preventing spread to their spouse. These considerations are not as true for people with other injuries or infections. And then there's a reference to no-fault compensation. And it suggests that an alternative approach could be a review of the case for a no-fault compensation scheme. I'm not going to read through that. Um, 
if we go over the page, conclusions, paragraph 15, the ring fence around the haemophiliacs is difficult to maintain. Finding another place to re-establish it is also difficult. If there is to be further movement, then it might be possible to defend a ring fence around all HIV cases infected in the UK by blood, organ and tissue donation undertaken as part of medical treatment. This further concession, however, would send the wrong signals to other groups already lining up to press their own case for compensation. Reopening the no-fault compensation issue would not resolve the immediate problem and could be unattractive on other grounds. It comes down to a question of where ministers wish to take a stand against claims for compensation. Um, is it fair to read this as, in terms of the perspective of departmental officials, um, not enthusiastic for a change in policy, but essentially saying it's your job, ministers, if you want to, to, to change the course? They were not at all enthusiastic for understandable reasons. I don't um, doubt that uh, their reasons are, uh, are strong ones. Um, but I think this, I, one can almost imagine the term the secretary or Strawn Heffel saying, put in everything you can find. There's even the Ministry of Defence having an accident um, and so on. Um, try and make the case as strongly as possible because we believe this minister doesn't understand the dangers of precedent. Um, and they were right to put those arguments, those are real ones. Um, but I believed, and I, th I think, I think we were shown to be more or less right that, that they could be dealt with those arguments. Um, and then just to complete the picture for today, um, uh, uh, if we look at a written parliamentary answer, the 18th of June, 1991, HSOC 0001432. Um, it's left-hand column under the heading blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. So David Steele asks the question to ask the Secretary of State for Health if he will make immediate payments to non-haemophiliacs who contracted HIV AIDS through infected National Health Service blood transfusions. And then your written answer, the government have no plans to extend further the special financial help available for haemophiliacs. We haven't changed the policy yeah. by then. Yeah. So as of June 1991, the, the position remains yeah. unaltered. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll look then next, and so my suggestion is we do this in the morning, uh, at the decision-making at the latter end of 1991 and how the policy changed mm -hmm. and when. Thank you. Um, so if, if that's a convenient moment to stop for today. Uh, yes, it is. So we'll, uh, we'll meet again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. And uh, so I should say I would anticipate that we will finish Lord Waldegrave's evidence by lunchtime tomorrow. Including time for the... Including time for questions. I think that's likely, yes. Very well. So it's likely that certainly by, by 2 o'clock tomorrow, uh, allowing for straying into the what would normally be the lunch hour in case, um, we will be finished so that you know. Uh, but we'll start at 10 as ever. Thank you, sir.